Let's learn a, a bit about special relativity here today. And this is a picture of a young Einstein when he was working in the patent office in Switzerland. And it shows him at about the time that he was developing his theory of special relativity and many other things as well. We'll start with what he used for the postulates of special relativity. And these are basically what he based the theory on. The postulate is an assumption or axiom, a prerequisite, a basic principle. So he had two of them, although the second is actually a consequence of the first. So here's what he started with. The laws of physics must be the same in all inertial reference frames. Now, an inertial reference frame means one that is non-accelerated. So special relativity may not work so well when you have things being accelerated, uh, but it will apply to situations where you have constant velocity or constant speed. So actually, if it's constant speed but not constant direction then it's accelerating so we'll just say constant acceler or constant velocity and this is known as the galilean principle of relativity because galileo actually proposed this idea he talked about doing experiments in the hold of a ship that was moving through calm waters and imagining having something like a, a wine skin that had a leak at the bottom of it and it was hanging up. And to a person on the ship, it would appear that those drops were falling straight down as if the ship was at rest. So he had other ideas as well, kind of fun ideas, but he was the first one who started thinking about these things. Now, for Galileo, those laws of physics only meant laws of motion. That's pretty much all there were. And at the time, pretty much the only law of motion was what became Newton's first law of motion, that an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted on by an unbalanced outside force, or an object in motion will continue in motion with constant speed and direction unless acted on by an unbalanced outside force. But for Einstein, the laws of physics meant all of them, including the ones that had been developed in the 1800s, the laws of electromagnetism. And you see here the top one is one we've studied. The integral of E dot dl is equal to the negative time derivative of the flux of the magnetic field. And then there's an expression for the integral of B dot dl, and you can see something that it has here. Now, something that is in these laws of motion Hang on a sec. Something built into these two laws, if you combine them, you can get a wave equation for electromagnetic waves. And when you have that wave equation, something that comes out of the wave equation is the speed of those electromagnetic waves. So I want to have a look at those here for a minute. Turns out the speed predicted by Maxwell's equations for those laws of electromagnetism is that the speed of the electromagnetic waves will equal one over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. And you can monkey around with the units on this, and it turns out that if you use the units we've used for epsilon naught, which is Coulomb squared over Newton meter squared, and then the units we've used for mu naught, which is Tesla meters per amp, and you get all of those things down to their basic levels, you end up with this expression having units of meters per second. And 
the speed that shows up is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. It's the speed of light. Okay, so electromagnetic waves, as predicted by Einstein's special theory of relativity, move at the speed of light. Okay, well, that's a consequence of the laws of physics. Let's go back to our little PowerPoint here, wherever it went. There it is. Okay, so built into this is the speed of light. And we start with this one. The laws of physics must be the same in all inertial reference frames. Well, built into those laws of physics is the speed of light. And the second postulate is a consequence of the first. It is the speed of light in a vacuum has the same value in all inertial frames, regardless of the velocity of the observer or the velocity of the source emitting the light. Huh. That means light travels at the same speed for everybody, according to them. Okay. They all think it's traveling at the speed of light. Well, you can start coming up with things that might go wrong in this case. And let's take a look at some weird ideas you might have going on here. Let's imagine that we have a rocket ship here and maybe right now the rocket ship's at rest and there's an astronaut standing on top of it and this astronaut has a super duper flashlight and this super duper flashlight can send out a beam of light but while it's doing that it'll measure the speed at which that light beam leaves the flashlight and also, it has the ability to detect incoming light and measure the speed of that light. So we'll just send this out. The astronaut turns on the flashlight and looks at the speed indicated by the flashlight, and it says, yep, the light's leaving me at the speed of light. So, well, that's a good thing. Now, let's suppose that the rocket engine has fired for a while, and now the rocket is moving in this direction at 0.5c, half the speed of light. The astronaut turns on the light bulb or the flashlight and measures the speed that the light is moving away. And the flashlight says, yep, it's moving away at the speed of light. So that's good. That confirms Einstein's postulate there. Well, let's toss some other things into the mix here. Okay, let's imagine that we've got this astronaut on the first flash on the first spaceship with his super duper flashlight. And <laughs> you can hear the dog out there, maybe. Anyway, got this flashlight beam on here and sends out the light. And it just says it's going at the speed of light. But let's put in a second, second spaceship over here. And as an astronaut on that one as well. But let's suppose that this spaceship has fired its engine and it's headed in this direction at half the speed of light. And I'm just picking that as a number. It doesn't matter what it happens to be. But there's an astronaut on this flashlight and or on this spaceship, and she has a flashlight, and it's one of the super duper models that'll measure the speed of light. And she looks at this incoming light from the first spaceship, which this astronaut says it was leaving at the speed of light. Well, her flashlight says it's arriving at the speed of light. Hmm. Okay, even though she's headed in that direction at half the speed of light, then we could repeat the experiment. Now we can have this spaceship traveling at, let's make this one seven-tenths of the speed of light. Okay, now 
with old Galilean relativity that we might have talked about, the light, which is leaving this flashlight at the speed of light, we think it's going through space at 1.7 times the speed of light. But this person says it's only going at the speed of light. Well, that's relative to them. So maybe an observer who was at rest over here, if this rocket wasn't firing, they'd say it was coming in at one point or at, yeah, 1.7 times the speed of light. This would happen if you were standing on a flat car and you could throw a baseball at 40 meters per second. If that train was traveling in the direction you're throwing the baseball at 40 meters per second, someone standing on the ground measuring the speed of the baseball was, would say it's traveling at 40 plus 40 or 80 meters per second. But somehow that's not happening with this light. And in fact, even if these two people are moving toward each other, this person's moving at half the speed of light relative to maybe a planet that's sitting out here. This person's moving at seven tenths the speed of light, sends out a light beam, this person still says the light is arriving at the speed of light. Well, this is kind of weird stuff. Everybody's going to be saying the light's traveling at the speed of light. In fact, if they measured their relative speeds to each other, they'd say they're not 1.2 times the speed of light. So they'd actually agree on a particular number. We'll learn how to calculate that in a few days. But something weird's going on here. So something's going to have to give. And Einstein realized this. And one of the things that had to give was the way that time is measured in the two systems. And so let's take a look at that. Um, and we're not going to revisit the astronauts there yet. But let's just suppose this is a light clock is what this happens to be. And something we'll depend on here is distance equals rate times time, or a time interval will equal the distance traveled divided by a rate. Okay. So the way that this clock works, there's a mirror up here. This is a strobe right here. And a strobe light. It just flashes every once in a while. This is a photo cell. And they're connected by a wire. And this distance is very small compared to the length of this thing. We'll just imagine that the, the distance from the strobe and the photo cell up to this mirror is L. So we'll have that. Now, here's the way this clock works. The strobe will flash. The light from that flash will travel up to the mirror, reflect off of it, and come back down to the photo cell. These two things are actually separated by a very short distance compared to L, so this isn't a scale drawing. And when the photo cell gets the signal, it sends a signal through a short wire to the strobe and it flashes again. And so this thing will flash every once in a while. And here's how far the light has to travel. It has to make a round trip up and back to the mirror. And again, we're going to imagine that the sideways distance here is really small, you know, like maybe, you know, a fraction of an inch. And this mirror could be a whole long ways away. You could make it 150,000 kilometers if you wanted to. And uh, that way, the round trip travel time would be one second on this thing. But it could be anything. It doesn't matter. Well, the delta T, as measured by a person who is in the rest frame of this clock, that means they think the clock is at rest, the whole thing, this part and this part is just sitting there, they would say delta t is going to equal the total distance traveled, which is going to be 2L, divided by the speed at which the light signal traveled up there and back, which is going to be C. So we would call this a proper time. 
It's measured in the reference frame, the rest frame of the clock, where you think the clock is at rest. Okay, now we're going to imagine that someone is an observer of some sort who's outside the rest frame of the clock is seeing this clock moving sideways with respect to them. And what are they going to say the time interval is? Okay, well, I've started the drawings for this. In each one, I'm gonna need a strobe and a photo cell. I've got the mirror up here in every case. And I don't know why we use dashed lines to represent a mirror, but we do. And, okay, we've got our photo cells, our strobes, and they're connected by a wire, of course. So we'll have that. Okay, um, first event, the strobe flashes. Okay. Now, in some time delta T, eventually that light is going to get back down to the photo cell a person in the rest frame of the clock just thinks it goes straight up and straight back down. But this person who sees the clock as a moving object isn't going to see that. They're going to measure some time on their clock. And they'll say, well, in the time that it took for the light to get up there and back, and I'll call that time delta T prime, okay, this is in the point of view of the person who sees it as a moving clock, the clock will have moved to the right a distance V delta T prime. Because okay. the clock is moving to the right at a constant speed V. By the way, in the book, they use the letter U for this. It doesn't really matter what letter we use, but that's what we'll have anyway. So it's moved V delta T. Well, Here's what has to happen. First, the flash of light from the clock has to go up and hit the mirror. Okay. And while that's happening, the clock has moved to the right a distance V delta T prime over two, because it's half of the time interval. Now, this distance up here is still L, but, it's not the total distance traveled by the light anymore. The distance traveled by the light is going to be V delta T prime divided by two. Well, this is a right triangle. We get to use the Pythagorean theorem. The distance that the light actually travels is the hypotenuse of this triangle, and it'll be the square root of L squared plus V delta T prime divided by two. And that's how far the light has to travel just to get up to the mirror. Then it has to travel that far again to get back down to the photo cell. So this is also going to be the square root of L squared plus V delta T prime over two squared. Now, the time interval that will actually be measured on this clock by this person who's standing here watching it race by they're going to say that the time interval, delta T prime, it's this same delta T prime, is going to equal the total distance traveled, which is two of these things. So two times the square root of L squared plus V delta T prime over two squared divided by, that's the total distance traveled, we divide it by the speed. They say the light's traveling at the speed of light. They don't have a problem with that. So that's what we end up with. Well, I've got 
I want to know delta T prime, and I've got it on both sides of this equation. So the way to do that, square both sides, and I'll get delta T prime squared is going to equal four times, when I square this, I'll get L squared plus, I'm going to write this V delta T prime as V squared delta T prime squared over four. So simplify that. And I'm over C squared here still. And let's see, what else have we got? Um, I can simplify this a bit. I'll come up here and do that. Delta T prime squared is going to equal 4L squared plus, when I distribute the 4 through there, I'll have V squared delta T prime squared. And I'm dividing it by C squared. I'll just put the C squared on the bottom of this and the C squared on the bottom of that. And I'm going to bring this term over to this side. And I'll have on the left side, delta T prime squared is going to equal, whoops, not equal, but minus V squared delta T prime squared over C squared. And that'll equal 4L squared over C squared. <clears throat> Okay, again, it's delta T prime that I want, so I'll factor it out of this expression, and I'll have delta T prime squared times the quantity, I'll have 1 minus V squared over C squared equals 4L squared over C squared, and then divide this thing out of both sides. So then delta T prime squared is going to equal 4L squared over C squared divided by the square root of 1 minus, whoops, not the square root yet, 1 minus V squared over C squared. That's the next step. Now I take the square root and I get delta T prime is equal to, well, when I take the square root of the top of this thing, I get 2L over C. And then I've got the square root of that stuff on the bottom, 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, hey, that's our delta t. That's the delta t that we had wherever it went for the clock that was at rest. So I can rewrite this as delta t divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. <clears throat> well, there's a certain factor that shows up in a lot of the calculations that we're going to be doing in special relativity. And instead of thinking, it as, thinking of it as dividing by that thing, we're going to write it a diff somewhat different way. And we'll have delta T prime is equal to delta T times 1 over the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. And this shows up so many times in special relativity that we use a symbol for it that simplifies things a bit, and it's the Greek letter gamma. That's my approximation of it today. And it's just equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And that's something that'll show up. Well, how often is this going to show up? Here's something that happens. Um, you can't have V be greater than C, because if you do, then you'd have an imaginary number for the square root of this thing. You'd have V over C being greater than 1, 1 minus 
something greater than one is going to be negative and you've got problems when that's the case. In fact, uh, you can't have V equal to C either, because if V is equal to C, you'd have this one minus one here, which is zero, and the square root of zero, you can't divide by that. So it'd be undefined in that case. But let's see mathematically what V over C looks like for various things. So I'm going to go to a spreadsheet that I've got here somewhere. Not the PowerPoint. Hmm. I don't know where it went. Oh, here it is. Um, let that be what we're looking at. Yeah, here's a the spreadsheet where I calculated for various values of V over C, I calculated gamma. And something you can see here for V over C equals 0.1, that's 10% of the speed of light. You'd have 1.005. That's not that different from one. In fact, if you were measuring to only two significant figures, you'd never see anything. To three significant figures, yeah, you'd start to see a little variation in that last significant figure. And then at 0.2, that's 20% of the speed of light, you'd have 1.02. So there's a 2% difference when you're going 20% the speed of light. But then it starts getting a little bigger. At 3% or 0.3, that's 30% the speed of light, you'd actually have 1.05, which is about a 5% difference. At 0.4, you'd have a 9% difference. At 0.5, a 15% difference. Now these things are starting to get noticeable. Um, a 15% difference on a clock, you could measure that. 55%, it's up to just about 20%, 19.7% difference. Um, at 0.6 times the speed of light, it's a 25% difference, and it starts getting bigger and bigger as you go up. And you can get up to 90% the speed of light, 0.9. All of a sudden, it's a 230 or 130% difference, basically. And then it just goes up from there. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. At 99% the speed of light, the values you get are 700% of the original values. And then at 99.99% the speed of light, it'd be crazy. So what does this look like if we look at a chart of this? Okay, um, I don't have this chart labeled very well, but uh, the vertical axis on this thing is gamma and the horizontal axis is the speed of light there's the speed at which you're traveling. Uh, one over here would be if you're traveling at the speed of light, and you can see that the curve approaches that asymptotically, kind of, but it just goes through the roof. It's kind of crazy. But for a long time, it's pretty flat, not so noticeable, but measurable if you're being really careful. And so that's an interesting idea. Well, let's close that and go back to our presenter here, our visualizer, and see what we can do with these things. So now we're back at this. Here's what we can conclude. Moving clocks run slow. And this is according to observers who have the clock moving or see the clock moving with respect to them.
Well, is the clock actually running slow? It depends on your viewpoint. If you're the person traveling with the clock, you think it's doing just fine. You can have all kinds of watches with you and stopwatches. Maybe you've got a steady pulse rate of 72 beats per minute. Okay, and you can count 72 off and you see your clock sweep through a minute. Okay, you think the clock's just fine. Your heart beats just fine. Everything's just fine. But for that person who sees the clock as moving, they're going to say the clock runs slow. Well, what about a biological process? What's going to happen with those? Here's what's going to happen. At some level, everything that happens depends on an electromagnetic signal passing from one point to another. And maybe here's the thing. That represents the end of a nerve ending. This represents the end of a, another adjacent nerve ending that's supposed to receive a signal from this. And maybe this is a signal that's going to tell the heart to beat. Okay, something like that. Well, if you're at rest, the photon just has to travel from here down to here, and you get your regular things happening at the regular rate. But let's suppose that we have an observer who sees this biological organism as a moving clock, and a photon is about to leave this nerve ending up here, and by the time that photon gets to this nerve ending down here, everything's moved over and it had to travel farther than just the distance here. And so they'd say, hey, your heart's beating slow to the person who's on this spaceship or whatever it is that's moving sideways. And everything takes place more slowly when people see that thing is moving. Wow. Well, Let's try some problems. Oh, that's just one of the early predictions of special relativity. There's another one that goes with that. And it's this. Let's see. I think I meant, no, I'll just flip that. Moving lengths appear shortened along the direction of motion. Hmm. Okay, well, what we have so far, we've got Delta T prime is equal to gamma delta T. So moving time intervals, if you see a clock moving, you would say that the time intervals are too long. The clock is running slow. So that one second is taken a second and a quarter or something like that. Um, so you see the time getting stretched out. Um, the moving clock is running slow, according to your clock. Uh, but also, moving lengths appear shortened along the direction of motion. We're going to start talking about proper time. The proper time, delta t, is the proper time. It's measured in the reference frame. Proper. Yeah, it looks kind of like proper in the reference frame of the clock. So for someone at rest with respect to the clock, we'll talk about proper lengths. L is a proper length. And this could be the length of just about anything. And it's measured in the reference frame of whatever the length happens to be. So. Um, if I'm sitting here at my tabletop, I can measure the proper length of the tabletop. But if my house and everything on it was traveling in some direction at the speed of light, 
or not at the speed of light, at a very high speed, someone else would see it coming by and they'd think it was a shorter length. And what we'll get is L prime, and we use all sorts of different notations for these. This is just what jumped into my head today. It would be L, the proper length, divided by gamma. So for a length, moving length, we'll end up dividing it by gamma instead of multiplying it by gamma. And now we can try a few example problems that will show this happening. Okay, um, muons, it's an elementary particle, has the same charge as an electron, but they have a lifetime of 2.2 microseconds. And uh, one of the earliest observations of special relativity was muons. They were discovered, well, a few decades after Einstein wrote the paper, but it was kind of a confirmation of that. If they're in a laboratory and they're not traveling at a high speed, they've got a lifetime or a half-life actually of 2.2 microseconds. So after 2.2 microseconds, half of them will decay into other things. But what if you accelerate them to a speed of 0.9994 C times the speed of light? What will their lifetime be as measured in the laboratory frame of reference? Well, we're going to want to know what is delta T prime going to be? Well, it's going to be gamma times delta T. Delta T is measured in their lifetime. So this will be whatever the gamma is for 0.9994C. And we can calculate that. 1 over the square root of 1 minus, when you write the speeds this way, point. 9994C divided by C, that has to get squared in there, and we'll be multiplying by the proper time, 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. And what do we get? Delta T prime. Okay. Um, Let's see. Okay, for gamma, I actually get uh, 28.9 at that speed. So And I would actually get uh, 63.5 microseconds, or 63.5 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. So quite a bit longer. Okay, during their lifetime, how far will they travel in the laboratory frame and in the muon frame? So for that was part A there. Well, in the laboratory frame, lab frame, we claim that uh, the distance traveled is going to be their speed point. Actually, it's just rate times time. So point nine 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 four times 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second times 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. So let's see, whatever that turns out to be. Yeah, we get about 660 meters. 
let's see, we've only got two significant figures on that. So that kind of knocks down. In fact, uh, that should have only been two significant figures. So uh, let's call that 64 microseconds for that. Okay, 660 meters. Well, here's something. Muons are created in the Earth's upper atmosphere by cosmic rays that are usually mostly uh, protons and electrons that come in from outer space and they are traveling at very nearly the speed of light and they'll hit things in the upper atmosphere, um, particles, nuclei, things like that, and create muons. And they're usually created about 100,000 feet up, which is roughly 30,000 meters. Okay, well, if we ignored special relativity and we thought those muons all had lifetimes of 2.2 times 10 to the minus six seconds, we'd think, okay, after you drop down 660 meters from 30,000 meters or so, you should be down to half the number of muons that you had generated up there and another 660 meters and you'd be down to a fourth another 660 meters you'd be down to an eighth and by the time you get to the surface there shouldn't be any muons left so great we won't have any except we get nearly the same number of muons at the surface of the earth as we're, you would get on a balloon flight up to 30,000 meters so what's going on well, their clocks are running slow. So let's figure out how far they travel in the muon. Actually, this is probably the time, if we take a relativity into account, if we multiply this time by their speed, we could figure out how far they'll travel before they uh, half of them will decay. And so we can actually do that. It'll be, well, longer than 660 meters anyway. Um, 0.9994 times 3 times 10 to the 8th times 64 times 10 to the minus 6. Then I get about, uh, let's see, 19,000 meters. So that's how far they'd travel. So most of them would still be... Uh, or half of them would still be in existence at that time. But the ones coming from the upper atmosphere are going faster than this. So it's even different. <clears throat> However, the muon frame, how far do they think they travel? Okay, so this was part I of that thing. Part I, I in the muon frame. Oh, let's see. They think they traveled. Let's see. Actually, I should have um, included. Actually, the calculation I just did was kind of the laboratory frame here. This is actually the muon. Um, this should be part two. This is the muon frame. They think half of them are half of themselves are going to die half in 2.2 microseconds. They will agree that they're traveling this fast. And so this is actually the distance that they think they've traveled. But in the lab frame, Okay, they don't last for 2.2 microseconds, or in our reference frame, they're going really fast, so their clock runs slow. We think they last for 64 microseconds, and so the distance that they travel is going to be, we agree on the speed, 0.9994 times the speed of light. But we think because they're going so fast, they've lasted longer. And so we do get that higher number 
Um, 1.9, well, let's just call it 1.9 times 10 to the fourth meters, which is 19,000 meters. So a lot farther. Anyway, and the moving length appears short uh, to the muons. This is a length that they pass through, but it looks shorter to them, compressed along the direction of motion. And this is all the longer that they think it is. And if, let's see, somewhere up here, I actually calculated gamma. It was, I don't know what it was. Oh, 28.9. And if I take that 19,000 meters, and divide it by 28.9. I get 660 meters. So actually that should be called 29, I guess. Um, to, no, actually on this, we can claim three significant figures. But uh, yeah, if you take this length, which is in the laboratory frame, but the muons are moving at a high speed relative to that, they see it as a shortened length. So divide, take this and divide by gamma, and that's how you get that. So there's some, our first example problem here. Okay, uh, the rest radius of the earth is 6,370 kilometers and its orbital speed around the sun is 2.98 times 10 to the fourth meters per second, by how much would the Earth's diameter appear to be shortened to an observer position to, so as to be able to watch the Earth move past at that speed? Well, this is a pretty small speed compared to the speed of light. I'm not sure it's going to, we'll be able to do this calculation with the precision that we've got. But here's the actually, we can figure this out by how much would it appear to be shortened. So we'll call D the rest diameter and which is going to be twice that. So uh, 12,740, I think, 6370 times 2, yeah, and let's let uh, D, I'll call it D prime, is equal to Diameter observed by, oh, I don't know, observer. <laughs> um, diameter observed by person watching Earth fly by. F. 2.98 times 10 to the fourth meters per second. And we may be able to do something with this, okay? So this may be our first example of a, an approximation. I didn't realize I had this problem in here. Um, this is going to appear to be shortened. We take this and divide it by gamma. So D prime will equal d divided by gamma. And we can calculate gamma, but I'm going to show you a trick here. So we'd like to know what is d minus d prime. It says, by how much would the Earth's diameter appear to be shortened to an observer? It doesn't ask what they'll appear, what they'll see as that diameter. We just want to know by how much will it appear to be shortened. Well, d minus d prime will equal d minus d divided by gamma, which is going to equal d 
times one minus one over gamma. Okay with that so far? One over gamma, gamma remember, is one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. One over gamma is equal to the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. And now I'm going to pull a trick. Uh, let's see, I think I've got it written down here. A relation we will use several times in relativity is the following power theories. Okay, here's the power series. It is one plus x to the n is equal to one plus nx plus um, n times n minus one x squared over two factorial. And then it just kind of keeps on going there. You can have other stuff, but uh, that'll probably be enough. For us, x is going to be negative, so we'll actually have a 1 minus nx, and then plus, because you'll be squaring a negative and stuff like that. But our x is going to be v squared over c squared. And so when we use this thing, uh, our power series, our 1 over gamma, is actually going to look like this. It'll be 1 minus 1 half times v squared over c squared plus, let's see, n is, yeah, 1 half. So I'll have um, 1 half times n minus 1 is going to be minus 1 half. And then I'll have x squared, which is v squared over c squared squared. And that'll be over 2 factorial again. But on this one, what I'm going to have is actually minus 1 eighth um, v squared over c squared. And then I can keep going with this series. But it turns out it's not really going to matter because v over c is small v squared over c squared is really small, and v squared over c squared squared is going to be crazy small. So let's do some calculations. v over c in this case, 2.98 times 10 to the fourth. So divided by 3 times 10 to the eighth, and I get... Uh, 9.93 times 10 to the minus fifth. So that's pretty small. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, and we're dividing it by two on this. Oh, no, that's just V over C. I haven't squared it yet. So uh, let's see. Where's my squared button? There it is. Okay, when I square it, um, v squared over c squared, that's going to be 9.87 times 10 to the minus ninth. Okay, and I'm dividing by 2, and I'm subtracting that away from, from 1. All right, if we were actually going to try to calculate this length, it would differ by basically one part in 100 million. Okay, we don't have that kind of precision on the length of this thing. We've only got four sig figs. We'd never notice it. But we can calculate how much it's going to shrink by because I can do 1 minus 1 over gamma. And, oh, by the way, I can, the next term in this series is going to be smaller again by that smaller than this part by that amount again, so it can be completely ignored. Okay, anyway, I've got 1 minus 1 over gamma in here. So 1 minus 1 over gamma is going to equal 1 minus 1 minus 1 half v squared over c squared. Oh, it's just going to equal approximately, and 
approximate to one part in a hundred million, or actually smaller than that, it's just going to equal one half V squared over C squared. Oh, well, that's easy. Then the shrinkage D minus D prime is going to equal D, the diameter, times one half V squared over C squared, which is going to be uh, what was it? 12,740 kilometers. Times one half V squared over C squared. Well, if I take that last thing I've got here and divide it by two, I get 4.9 times 4.93 times 10 to the minus ninth. So I can take that, I may convert this into meters just for the heck of it. So 12,740 kilometers, I'll just add three more zeros on there and get meters. And I get 6.2 times 10 to the minus two meters. So out of this 12,740 kilometer diameter, it's going to appear shortened by 6.29 centimeters. Well, I can show you that. Okay, that's how much it's going to be shrunk by out of 12,740 kilometers. So we're not going to notice it. Okay, that's our first example of using this series expansion, and I use this a lot in special relativity. So work through this problem and get the hang of doing that, because we're going to be doing it again and again. And a lot of times it'll just be 1 minus 1 over gamma, and that'll end up equaling 1 half V squared over C squared. So see how that works. All right. Suppose a spaceship flies past the Earth at 0.99 C. So we can draw a picture of the Earth, and I think I'll try to make it a particular diameter, actually. Um, maybe make this Earth have a, or a radius. I'll give it a diameter of, um, just for the heck of it, three and a half centimeters is the diameter, so this is just my drawing that's going to be that size. And uh, I got it too close to that wooden part. Well, we'll just kind of imagine finishing this off. I've got a wooden stand that sticks out in the way here. Anyway, there's Earth, according to an observer who sees Earth at rest. Now, <clears throat> Somebody's out here on a spaceship, and that spaceship is flying past at 0.99 C. So if we call this the diameter of the Earth that we have here, they are going to see a D prime for the Earth that is going to be the ordinary diameter divided by gamma. And what's gamma for somebody going at 0.99c? Well, it's going to equal 1 over the square root of 1 minus, by the way, if v is equal to 0.99c, something we often use is the Greek letter beta to represent the speed divided by the speed of light. And 0.99c divided by uh, c ends up being 0.99. So beta is equal to that. And a way that you often see gamma written is just 1 minus beta squared. So beta is just going to be the fraction of the speed of light something is going. And it's handy to write it that way. So I'll just go 1 divided by the square root of 
one minus 0.99 squared. And then I get 7.09. And so that's beta. Well, my diameter here was uh, on my scale drawing was seven centimeters. If I divide that by 7.09, I'm gonna get one centimeter for the new diameter. or 0.99 centimeters, and I don't have hundreds of millimeters on here anyway. Um, but I can make a sketch. Um, they'll see the Earth only shortened along the direction of motion, so it'll look like this to them. What was the question? How will the Earth appear? That's what it's going to look like to them. In this direction, perpendicular to their direction of motion, it's not shrunk, but along the direction of motion it is. And so it'll look like a pancake to them, maybe a fat pancake, but that's what it will look like. So that's kind of neat. Okay. These are kind of fun problems, imagining things like this. Assume the distance to the galactic center is 27,000 light years. Can a person, in principle, travel from Earth to the center of the galaxy in a normal lifetime? Explain either from a time dilation or a length contraction argument. Okay, well, time dilation, moving clocks run slow. They could move at a high enough rate so a time interval to them of maybe oh say 10 years or 20 years or something like that or 29 well 29 years let's say 14 and a half years uh would appear to be 27,000 years to somebody who was watching them do it from a length contraction argument if they're traveling toward the center of the galaxy at a very high rate of speed, I wouldn't want to go to the center of the galaxy. There's a massive black hole there, but uh, if you don't get too close to it, you're all right. But anyway, to them, that 27,000 light years could be shrunk considerably. So let's see what we can do. What constant speed would be needed to make the trip in 29 years? Hmm. Oh, okay. It is going one way in 29 years. So, well, they're going to have some speed V, and that's going to be some fraction of C. Uh, actually, let's do V over C, and just let that be our beta value. And that's how fast they're going to have to go. Somehow the distance they travel is going to have to be 27,000 light years, but they're going to observe that it's only 29 years. So we'll have a delta T that looks to be 29 years. Delta T prime from our viewpoint is going to be about 27,000 years. And why do we think that? Because they're going to be going extremely close to the speed of light. And the distance to the center is 27,000 light years. That's how far light travels in 27,000 years. So that's what we would think is going on here. And delta T prime is going to be longer. Yeah, it's going to be delta T divided by gamma. Okay. Well, what's gamma going to have to be? Somehow I've got this upside down.
Oh, delta T times gamma. Good grief. That's what I'm, I'm doing the length thing and I should be doing the time equation. So gamma will equal delta T prime over delta T. There we go. Okay, so 27,000 years divided by 29 years, which is going to be a big number. Um, in fact, I'm going to leave that number alone for the time being. Uh, but gamma will equal gamma equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. Okay, if I kick that out from underneath, the square root of 1 minus beta squared is going to equal 1 over gamma. I actually flip both sides of that thing. Square both sides, and I'd get 1 minus beta squared is going to equal 1 over gamma squared. And uh, I didn't plan my paper very well. Anyway, beta squared would equal 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. And beta, the fraction of the speed of the light, light that they're going, is going to be 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. OK, so there's gamma. Um, 1 over gamma is going to be the inverse thing. Wow, am I going to have to do another inverse thing? We'll see. I don't think so. Um, yeah. For gamma, I get um, 931. So this would equal the square root of 1 minus 1 over 931 squared. And that's a dimensionless quantity. Gamma is. So we can do that. Although it's then going to end up being, it would almost be easier to figure out the difference between their speed and the speed of light. But we'll go ahead and do this. Um, <laughs> um, to three significant figures, I get 1.00, but I think I'm going to have it show a zillion of them mode. I'll probably have to show maybe nine digits to get this thing to work out. Yeah, I get, uh, oh man. 0 0.99, how many nines do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's probably about as much as my calculator can do for significant figures. <laughs> uh, yeah, so your constant speed would have to be that times the speed of light. So. V is going to equal 0.9999994C. Oh, hum. Now, how much time would pass on Earth clocks while a ship made this one-way trip? It's going to be 27,000 years is how long we think it's going to be. We've only got two sig figs on the, on the distance, so they're going to be flying. This would have been a good problem to... Uh, to do the series expansion on. And instead of calculating the speed, you could calculate the difference between their speed and the speed of light. And you might do that as an exercise just for fun. Um, I think this one takes a little while and I may save that one for uh, next time we do something. It's kind of a fun problem as well. So. There's a good introduction to special relativity and time dilation and length contraction. And I got turned around on a couple of the problems a couple of times. Um, I have to stop and think about these things carefully. So you might do that as well. 
um, think about the problems carefully and redo all the problems I did. So, and there are lots in the book too. So I'll stop recording here.